Hello everyone, Linwood here, and I'm doing a different video today uh, because a very special and dear friend of mine uh, needed me to do an interview for her, uh, actually for a speech class that she had, and she asked I go ahead and film these questions, answer these questions truthfully in terms of uh, how I feel about Christianity and um, or really a belief in God, um, and upload them to YouTube for her. So I will let you know. Automatically, that is what this video is about. So, you know, just that way you're aware and um, that way you know. So, if you feel as though that's something that you are not up to watching, you knew it up front, and that way uh, if you choose to watch it through, you've chosen to of your own accord. And if not, then you've decided not to. But that way you don't feel as though I forced anything on you one way or the other. Um, and please do know that I do this in a manner of. Uh, goodwill and of an honest opinion, not as a manner of attack towards anyone. Um, so let me go ahead and start with these questions. Uh, question number one, what is your name? Linwood Darkus. Uh, question number two, how old are you? I am 30 years old. Um, number three, are you married? If not, do you believe in marriage? Yes, I am married. I have a wonderful wife named Allison. Um, number four, do you have children? Uh, yes, actually, I have one biological daughter, and I have several other young people that I mentor. Um, I am so thankful to be able to be a part of their life. Um, number five, what do you do for a living? Um, I'm actually a teacher for a high school age cosmetology program uh, where I teach how to do hair to high schoolers. Um, Number six, and this is where the good stuff starts. Uh, do you believe God is dead or alive? Um, I personally believe that God is alive and that Jesus is in fact risen. Uh, number seven, do you believe in the Bible? If so, what are your views of the Bible? Um, to be very plain, yes, I do believe in the Bible. Um, I believe that it is the infallible living word of God. I believe that it should be used, studied, understood, and utilize only in proper context, um, and that it should not be used to manipulate people uh, or to judge how good we are as Christians, uh, but that it should rather be utilized to continually uh, make us better ambassadors for Christ rather than using it to uh, almost be a tool of attack towards someone else. It was not intended for that. It is intended to better us as followers of Christ and to show people hope and uh, restoration and the mercies and love of God. Um, that was a bit longer than I intended there. Uh, question number eight. In your career, is there a problem with express expressing your belief or non-belief? Um, to be quite honest, to a certain extent, it is. Um, naturally, with me being a teacher, I deal with youth all the time, and everyone has a different uh, religious background and understanding, and so I have to be very sensitive of that. However, I must say that uh, it's it's important that I use wisdom and that we use wisdom as a whole when we're dealing with people. Um, Basically, uh, I can easily quote the Word of God and not really have any issues at work or anywhere else because when I'm doing it, I'm not quote-unquote Bible thumping. I'm not telling people, well, the Bible says in such and such book and such and such chapter, I simply quote the Word of God. And um, so to me, I can tell you something very plainly like... Um, let me see. Uh, I can say, uh, be mindful that a soft answer turns away wrath. And I didn't have to say, in the book of Proverbs, a soft answer turns away wrath. I'm just basically telling you that a soft answer turns away wrath. And at that point, it becomes a quote of wisdom. How is it any different to that person than you quoting some uh, author or anything like that. But the thing that gets me about it is as Christians, sometimes we act a little afraid to do that. And really, uh, we shouldn't be because the word still has power, whether we quote the exact uh, book and verse that it came from or whether we quote it in general, the power remains the same. The ability to restore and revive and heal remains the same. So we're discounting uh, the Word of God, if we feel as though it has to be quoted and in a situation of saying, in Matthew 3 and 28, it states, uh, 
it doesn't take away from the power of God. It's still the word and it's still effective. And by doing so, you are not forcing it down anyone's throat. It's just a basic conversational piece. And if they're interested in knowing where that quote came from, knowing more about it, you are then able to uh, share with them where it came from. And it was at a point where they wanted to know more about it and more about what your quote was and it allows you to share your faith to an extent to where it doesn't create an issue at work and it doesn't cause conflict um and if they are not interested then they don't ask you um let's see uh, and I, I just feel that way because honestly the bible tells us that he who wins souls is wise i feel like we should use wisdom when we are sharing the word of god with uh believers and non-believers alike um, number nine, why do you believe what you believe? Um, I personally believe in God because I've experienced him for myself. I have, uh, experienced answers to my prayers. I've experienced, uh, praying and seeing change happen, uh, praying and seeing my mother healed of cancer eight times, um, praying and seeing people where the doctors told them they had a heart attack and then come and you pray, they do another EKG and the EKG comes up completely clear. And I mean, when you have something like that happen, it's simply amazing. No other experience can take the place of that. And I understand uh, some people feel like, you know what, there could be an error, a miracle take place, whatever the case may be. And I just feel as though that's an awful lot of coincidence when it's in way more instances than one. So no one can really shake my experience there. Um, let me see here, uh, oh, number 10, uh, what do you base your belief on? Um, I base, I base my belief, number one, on the word of God, which is, uh, the Bible. Um, number two, my experience and my exposure to God, uh, in terms of how I have experienced him, uh, throughout my exposure and throughout my walk with Christ. Um, number 11, what is the evidence of your belief? Um, I really feel as though it's not just a matter of going to church. It is more of my character, my actions, my demeanor, my speech, my lifestyle. Of course, I go to church, but I I have to walk out uh the word. I have to walk out God's instruction. And if I'm not walking it out, how is it evident that I am a Christian? How can you see it? If I was to be held on trial, would you know by my actions to be able to uh, say he is uh, on trial for being a Christian? Is there enough evidence to even prove that I would be guilty of being a Christian? Or would it just be a matter of, oh, well, he goes to church? A lot of people go to church. It's more than going to church. Uh, to me, it's like when when you go to a court of law, they have to present enough evidence beyond a reasonable doubt. And really, I feel as though it has to be even further than that. As Christians, it shouldn't be beyond a reasonable doubt. It should be beyond all doubt, beyond a shadow of a doubt. You should be able to see I may still be flawed, and I am, uh, but I am still very much a follower of Christ, and my actions should portray that, not just where I'm going, but what I'm doing when I'm outside of the uh, the walls in the house of God, and that's just how it is. Um, not saying that all Christians are on the same level. Please do not get me mistaken. And please understand, I was at a different level at one point than I am now. And I'm still consistently growing. I'm nowhere near perfect. Uh, and at one point, I was making many, many mistakes. So this is not a road of, I'm a Christian. Everything is is like this and that. And all my ducks are in a row. It's a process of healing. It took you a long time to get to the state you're in, and it's going to take you a good while to transition out of that into uh, understanding the teachings of Christ. Keep in mind the disciples were in uh, Christ's presence for three years in ministry, and were still uh, going through the process of change and mentoring when he was crucified, and it wasn't until he left that they really started to step into the fulfillment of who they were in him. Um, but that's a whole nother side. Y'all gonna have me preaching. Um, let me see here. Number 12. Um, when did you start believing in God? And if not, why do you not believe? Um, I became a follower of Christ at the age of 20, actually. Uh, so 10 years ago. Um, let me see. Number 13. Why or what made you believe in God? Um, to be quite truthful, I 
began reading the Word of God on vacation, and um, it gradually began to change me, and I found wisdom and comfort in Christ's words that was beyond compare. I read the four Gospels, and I was compelled to act out Christ's teachings, um, and when I did this, I began to change for the better, and because I liked that change, I continued to follow Christ because I wanted to make sure that my life mattered, that what I was doing made a difference to someone. Um... Let's see, number 14, um, and I think there's like 25 of these. How do you get to know God? Um, number one, through his word, um, in prayer, in communicating with him, in worship, and trusting in his promises, um, and of course, fellowship with like-minded believers, hearing their testimonies. Um, I mean, there are so many different ways, and to me, I feel like you really get to a point where as you establish a relationship with God, you're able to see him in the simple, everyday things that we often overlook in life. And it may make me sound like a weirdo. I'm perfectly fine with being a weirdo, but that's just how I feel. Um, Let's see. Uh, number 15. It's hard for me to keep up with these. Uh, if there really is a God, why does he allow evil and bad things to happen? I think this is a great question. I used to really struggle with this. Um, and... I think that sometimes we look at it and we look at it from one perspective and it is really a very in-depth question. So to answer that, I would say uh, often we are, not often, we are always subject to the free will of others. And God allows free wills because he, if he forced us to live righteously or to live holy, uh, could we really say that our love and our service for him was genuine? I mean, if I'm forcing you to tell me you love me, can I really say that you love me? And you might, but how would anyone else really know? How would it genuinely be love if I have to force you to tell me you love me? If I have to force you to show me you love me? An act of love is of free will. And so we cannot adequately serve, worship, or love God if we are forced to be holy, forced to be righteous, or forced to be good. We, uh, do these things out of a desire to be more like him and a desire to please him. And um, we're given choices and free will, as are the angels. And um, we are, in the Bible, the Bible tells us that we are a little lower than the angels, just a little, just a tiny bit. And um, Satan himself is an angel, be it he is a fallen angel, uh, but he's still granted into the throne room of God, which is interesting. And just for reference there, you can see that in the book of Job in chapter one, uh, where he entered into like a meeting with the angels and uh, began to uh, tell God what he had been doing and even challenged him. It's an excellent study, uh, but I don't want to get too deep into it because this video will run forever. Um... Let's see here. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, so some of us will make the decision to live righteously and others don't. Uh, and what we have to understand is whatever decisions that we make, be it righteous or unrighteous, impact everyone that's tied to us, not just ourselves. And that's just a fact of life. My decisions impact my daughter. They impact my wife. They impact my mother. They impact my coworkers, my students, my friends. Everybody that I know is going to be impacted to some degree by the decisions that I make. So naturally, when I do something that is out of a state of unrighteousness, it's going to have a negative impact on those who didn't even make that decision. And it's just a matter of being tied to and having those relationships and that exposure to one another. Um, naturally some things do have a good impact and some have a bad impact even on the unrighteous and the word does tell us here that uh it rains on the just as well as the unjust and uh ultimately god allows that wickedness uh, because he grants the unholy the same mercy that he grants the holy. And I think sometimes as Christians, we forget that uh, that same mercy is extended. If that same mercy were not extended, then 10 years ago before I gave my life to Christ, I would have been doomed for hell just for the fact that I was not a present believer from birth on out. That same mercy that he gave to me that I didn't deserve, he gives to others that they don't deserve either. And that's the kind of God that I serve. And that's why I serve him because he is so abundant in mercy. Um, let's see here. Oh, I have so much I'm going to say. Um, he 
should have wiped me out for my sins and my evil. Uh, but even the word tells us that the wheat and the tares must grow together. And basically what that means is uh, there's a parable in the Bible about how a uh, sower came and put tares in with the wheat. And when they first start to grow, they look the same. Sometimes you'll see people that say they're Christians and they go to church and they're there faithfully, regularly, religiously even, but they are not wheat. They are tares. And you don't find out until you're around them a bit more. You start to see the real exposure and you start to see the fruit that they bear. But by that time, if you rip them out of there, it can actually damage the wheat by pulling it out also. So you have to let the two grow together. And on the day of harvest, it's actually harvested. And uh, then it's separated on the day of harvest. Um, and of course, each of them has different traits. But when you look at this parable, it's very detailed. Um, and it lets us know that we must grow together. And yes, the tares can choke out the wheat uh, to a certain degree. So what happens is basically the wheat is made stronger because it now has to push through this thicket of tares. Uh, and it, it strengthens those. So as more experienced believers in Christ, I believe that our job then is to protect and cover and shelter those that are uh, still babes in Christ and are less uh, experienced as as we are, it's, uh, that was weird the way it came out, but they're less experienced. They don't have that same exposure, that same belief, that same faith that we possess. And we should be modeling that for them so that way they can be strengthened and grow up despite the tears that are there. They can grow up and be strengthened in Christ also. Um, oh my goodness, so much, so much, so much. So basically, the question doesn't become so much of why does God allow evil Um but the question then becomes, will the present state of evil in this world rather strengthen us or choke us out? And even this is geared by our choice and our free will. Um, let me see here. Uh, question number 16. Are you religious? Um, honestly, about some things, yes, I am. But not what you would think. I religiously brush my teeth. I brush them at random crazy intervals during the day. Um, I religiously encourage other people. I religiously look for reasons to laugh and to be happy. And uh, I even religiously go to church. Um, question number 17, why are you religious? If not religious, why do you believe in God? Um, I'm going to say now that, when, like I said in the last question, I'm religious about some things, but not in terms of my relationship with Christ. And uh, here's why. is because serving God was intended to be, was it, was, it just wasn't intended to be an act of religion. Uh, I serve God because, you know, I love him. And I, I serve God as more than just when the church doors are open. I serve God uh, because I desire to have a relationship with him. And to make that more clear, like, I talk to my wife every single day. I kiss her, I hug her, I spend time with her, and I make decisions in consideration of her. And it's because I am in love with my wife um, that I do all of those things. If I can love my wife that much, then why shouldn't I be able to love the God that blessed me with my wife that much to be able to spend time with him and commune with him and uh, shower him with the the blessings and sacrifice of my praise and uh, obey him and love him and be considerate of how my decisions can harm his nature in terms of uh, damaging who he is. Because when people look at me as a Christian and I'm not on display as I should be, it basically discredits the gospel. It tells them that the word is ineffective um, and it is by no means ineffective. So am I religious? No, uh, I don't think I'm religious. I am just in love with my savior. Um, question 18, did you know uh, did you know that people think that God is not real or dead uh, because they can't see him, they don't believe in him? And yes, I did know that. Um, I myself used to be an atheist, um, so I feel as though I'm living proof of the power of God at work. That's all I have to say about that. Probably the only short answer you'll get out of me other than what's my name and age. Um, <laughs> if you spoke to someone, oh, number 19, if you spoke to someone that didn't believe, how would you tell them uh, why they should believe? And honestly, it depends on uh, it depends on the person in this instance. Um, 
let me see here. How can I word this? It depends on the person that you're dealing with in this because, of course, each person is going to have a, a different set of needs. So, um, Jesus even told two of his disciples, Peter and Andrew, uh, the, the, if you follow me, I will make you fishers of men. And um, I think that oftentimes we have to really look at that. Now, to, to be quite honest, it's important, as I said earlier, that we use wisdom and uh all of that, but I know sometimes this can be a bit confusing because if you're anything like me, you're not a fisherman. I'm not a fisherman. So when I look at this, I think, um, what do I know about fishing? And I don't know a ton, but I do know this. You cannot attract uh, every fish with the same type of bait. And so, um, you know, when it comes down to it, every fish is not going to be attracted to the same bait. So you can't use the same approach when witnessing to everyone. So the question then becomes, would you catch a shark with a worm? And typically the answer should be no. A shark usually is not going to be interested in that little worm on the end of your hook. Um, and the type of line has to be sufficient for that fish. So if I have a type of line that's not strong enough for the fish, then naturally my line will break. So the bigger the fish, the bigger the line has to be. Now, I know this sounds a little crazy, but uh, just stick with me for just a moment. Um, so I feel as though it's important that we have wisdom when we deal with unbelievers. And in uh, this instance, um, we have a fishing rod, and I feel as though the fishing rod embodies the word, and we cannot catch a fish without the word in general. We must be holding it. We must be word carriers. We need the rod in order to even catch the fish. Uh, but then we have the fishing line, and the fishing line on that rod is basically likened unto love. And the bigger that fish is, the 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 uh, the further away from Christ that this fish is, the harder this fish is to catch, the more love you're going to need. You can't just get by with a small little fishing line and call it love and think that you are going to achieve something if it's never meant for this type of fish. You're not trying to catch a guppy here. You're trying to catch something much larger. So, of course, the fishing line has to accommodate that. And without that fishing line or without that love, you can't catch anything because all you've got is the word. Um... Now, with that, then there becomes your, uh, your bait, and your bait then is your witness. And so keep in mind that your bait is no good to you without your line, which is love, and your bait is no good to you without your rod, which is the word. So it's not enough for me to just have uh, my witness. If I can't witness to people in love, my witness is no good. So you don't witness to people by telling them, if you don't get your life right, you're going to hell. That is not an effective or proper witness. You must do everything in the spirit of love. And this is in the word in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Everything that you do must be done in the spirit of love. Otherwise, it is in vain. It's pointless. It is as a tinkling brass and sounding cymbal. It's just, it's, just, it's no good. Um... So a witness without love is ineffective and a witness without the word is also ineffective. And I say all that to say this, we convince others about Christ and we convince others about the love of Christ when God's word is present and evident in our lives and when we can offer love to those that we should, by man's standard, we should hate. Um or condemn. And uh, we also compel them when we can become all things to all men, as Paul stated in the New Testament. Um, question number 20. I think this is the last one. This is. Um, question number 20. Would you be willing to change your belief? And in this instance, I would say yes and no. Um, my belief in Christ is unyielding. I just make that very plain. However, I've often considered converting to a Messianic or a Nazarite Jew. And the reason why is because basically your Messianic Jews are people who uh, they practice uh, the traditional biblical worship of God in terms of how it was in the Old Testament with the Jewish people in terms of celebrating the Passover, the different feasts, things of that nature um, that memorialize where they came from and help them to keep in mind how God had blessed them, things of that nature. Um, and I love that side of it. And um, they celebrate all these different memorials. They do all these different things. They still... Uh, are uh, very much word-based and studying the, the uh, Pentu, which is the first five books of the Old Testament uh, written by Moses. Um, 
And uh, to me, the thing that sets them apart from uh, most Jews is that they believe that Christ is actually the risen Lord and King and um, that he is the, the risen Messiah. And to me, this embodies how we as Christians should be. Um, the Bible states that we as Gentiles are engrafted into the uh, the family of God or into the Jewish people, um, and we are thereby adopted. And if I adopted a child from another part of the world or even from another household, um, whenever the family came together and celebrated, that celebration would include that new family member because they're a member of the family. And so uh, the same house rules would apply to them, the same love would be shown to them, and this is why I've considered converting to uh, Messianic Judaism. Um, because I refuse to give up my Jesus, but I desire to be uh, an acting member of the family that celebrates the way that the family celebrates and abides by the same uh, statutes and, and things of that nature. And I feel as though this is kind of how God intended for us to be, not to do away with... Uh, Old Testament and Jewish custom, but to rather embrace it and become a part of that family and take it and say, this is who I am. This is who I will be. This is what I will do. So for all of you who watched this far, thank you so much. I appreciate you. Um, this is not my norm, but if you like it, thumbs up, comment in the comment box below and let me know what you think. Um, take care, you guys. Until next time, God bless. You're fancy now.